United States have been living in a dream world. Our high standard of living, our great mobility, and our dependence on technology have led us to believe that we have met and conquered everything needed for a happy, fruitful style of life. But the United States has entered a new age, and it is one to which we have not yet adjusted our habits, expectations, and national policies. It's called the energy age. The Arab oil embargo, while it lasted, made us keenly aware that in 20th century America, a fourth essential has been added to the age-old necessities of life. Besides food, clothing, and shelter, we must have energy. It is an integral part of the nation's life support system, and we can no longer expect to get it with so little trouble and expense as we did in the recent past. Energy will never again be cheap. It can never again be perceived as infinite in supply or even abundant. It has ceased to be an ethereal something which can be gotten by the simple flicking of a switch or a turning of a key. A National Science Teachers Association study in 1975 viewed the situation in this way. The energy crisis is wide and long. It is as wide as our day-by-day -day lives and the environment we live in. It is at least as long as this century, for many of us, as long as our lives. It will grow slowly from crisis to crisis, and our responses will be slow to show effect. It cries out now for our understanding and action. Indeed, we have an energy crisis, but we also have an opportunity to intelligently and thoughtfully meet the crisis. In short, we have a new beginning. In the last few decades, nuclear energy has emerged to provide a portion of this nation's electrical power. But when one begins to talk about nuclear energy, one opens up a real can of worms, a controversy which leaves the layman inundated with conflicting expert opinion and data. Arguments on both sides of the issue are excellent, so we're anxious and confused about the merits and detriments of nuclear-generated power. But realizing that there is probably truth to both sides of the controversy, we inexpert people must somehow wade through the data and finally participate in the decision-making process as to the value of nuclear power in our lives. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission is an independent federal regulatory agency that was established by the Congress in 1975. Our responsibilities are to assure that if nuclear energy is used for commercial purposes, that it be done consistent with the protection of the public health and safety and the environment. There's quite a bit of paperwork involved in building a nuclear power plant, isn't there? A company that wants to build a nuclear power plant is required by law to come to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for two separate licenses. They need one license to build the power plant. They need a separate license to operate it. Now, back in 1962, an application for a nuclear power plant license looked about like this, a single volume. Today, we require much more information, uh, dozens of volumes. Uh, these reports here essentially go into every nut and bolt in a nuclear power plant. A lot of these reports have to do with environmental impact, uh, don't they? We look very carefully at the projected environmental impact of a nuclear project and try and establish license conditions which minimize whatever environmental impact there will be. Uh, are these all public uh, documents? Every report, uh, every letter uh, that we generate or is submitted to us as part of a nuclear power plant uh, application proceeding becomes public information. Uh, we place these reports in public document rooms, which are located near proposed reactor sites, and they are available to the public. What about during the entire licensing procedure? How else can the public participate in this? Our rules provide uh, for public hearings uh, at the construction permit stage uh, where we go to the site of the reactor and hold a hearing in which uh, members of the public have an opportunity to voice their concerns, uh, express their support, uh, and let the commission staff and the hearing board uh, know their views on the project. 
We also have provisions for holding separate hearings uh, before the plant is licensed to operate. As of late 1977, <coughs> how many nuclear power plants are online in this country, and what are your best projections for the end of the century? We have 65 nuclear power plants that are licensed to operate at the present time. Now, there are another 78 that are under construction. They have received their construction permits from the NRC. There are additional 59 units which we are reviewing for construction permit at the present time. Beyond these, there's another 13 where the utility has actually ordered a nuclear power plant. Uh, there are 15 cases where the company has said they are going to do so. And that brings us up with a total of 230 nuclear power plants, 230,000 megawatts. That should be a number that is valid for most of the rest of the century. Until the atomic age was ushered in, boilers were heated by burning coal, oil, or natural gas. But now, with help from Einstein's formula E equals mc square, man has developed a new source of heat to produce steam for an electric power plant, the heat produced by splitting atoms. It should be realized that there are two types of chain reactions, controlled and uncontrolled. If uncontrolled, all the energy released by the fission process is released in a split second, the atomic bomb. However, by using a device known as a reactor, scientists and engineers have learned to control the fission process and gradually release nuclear energy so that it can be put to useful work. What does a typical nuclear power plant look like? What operations are involved in creating energy from the atom? Let's see. This is the largest commercial nuclear power plant in the country. Could you describe the system at the Trojan power plant? All right, let's talk about a pressurized water reactor plant by talking about three major systems. The reactor itself includes the reactor vessel containing the reactor core, the fuel, the control rods for control of the reactor. This is all filled with water, which is under pressure so that it remains liquid through operation of the plant. This water is circulated through the reactor core where heat is picked up, through a steam generator where it uh, gives up heat to the secondary system, back through a reactor coolant pump where it's pumped back through the reactor core again. This is one system which we call the primary system or the reactor coolant system. The steam generator is a large heat exchanger where heat is given up by the primary system or the reactor coolant system through the secondary system this water is boiled, it forms steam, and it is taken from the reactor containment building through large pipes to the steam turbine. The steam goes through the turbine, causing the turbine to rotate, which is connected to the generator, which rotates the generator, producing electrical power. As the steam exhausts from the turbine, it goes through a condenser, or it is condensed back to liquid, and then is pumped back to the steam generator where it's again heated, turned into steam, and cycled back through the turbine. This we call the secondary system or the steam plant. This portion of the plant would be almost the same regardless of how the heat were generated, whether it be from coal, oil, natural gas, or whatever. Now we need a cooling medium to condense this steam back to water as it exits the turbine and goes through the condenser. For our particular plant, we have a large uh, natural convection cooling tower where we take water from the basin of the tower. The water is pumped from the cooling tower basin through the condenser where it condenses the steam back up over the fill in the cooling tower. Now, if you'll notice, the water only goes up about a fourth of the way up the tower, and then it is pumped through large headers where it is sprayed and broken up into fine droplets and falls back down to the basin. The tower is open at the bottom where air enters the tower, flows up through this just like a large chimney by natural draft, and the water gives up heat to the air and you get the large plume of water vapor coming out the top. So this is our third major system. The reactor coolant system, the primary system, 
the secondary system or the steam system and the circulating water system. The plant we've just visited is basically similar in reactor design to practically all other nuclear power plants in the country. The fuel used by nuclear reactors is uranium. It is found in relative abundance throughout the world. There are different kinds of uranium, however, called isotopes. And the particular uranium isotope that will split or fission, U-235, is very rare. U-235 comprises only about 0.7% of natural uranium. But there is another isotope, U-238, which is much more abundant and makes up the remaining 99.3% of natural uranium. It is not fissionable in the same sense as U-235. However, U-238 can be converted in a nuclear reactor into a useful fissionable material called plutonium-239. The only other natural nuclear fuel of consequence is thorium, a heavy, slightly radioactive metal. Thorium is not fissionable, but it is fertile, like U-238. So it can be converted into a fissionable isotope, U-233. This means that it, like plutonium-239, is not naturally occurring, but is a converted man-made isotope. For now, let's learn more about our basic nuclear fuel, uranium. What processes are involved in creating fuel for a reactor? The first step, obviously, is getting the material out of the earth. Although uranium is most often found in sedimentary deposits, the Carter Corporation's Schwarzwalder mine near Golden, Colorado, is a hard rock uranium mine. Mining is simply moving rock from the ground, whether it's an open pit operation or a deep mine like we have here at the Schwarzwalder. This is a hard rock uranium mine. It's fairly unique because it is in hard rock, and uh, it's an average size employing approximately 150 men on three shifts a day. We usually get out about 250 to 300 tons every day, and uh, the average grade is usually five to eight pounds of uranium per ton in here. An average day at the mine is consists of a team of miners uh, drilling out a round in the face of the ore body, which is usually 36 to 40 holes. They load it up with uh, dynamite and fertilizer and shoot it. let the air clear out for about 30 minutes and go back in and uh, pick it up with the end loaders and tram it to a place called a grizzly, which is a grid of steel bars that sizes the rock as it's dumped through there. It falls down the race to the next level, which is then again picked up and put into a waiting ore pocket where the, uh, near the shaft. And then uh, after the ore pocket is full, the skip comes down and it's loaded uh, approximately two tons at a time into the skips and then hoisted to the top of the shaft where it's put in another uh, great big holding pocket up there. And uh, then when it gets full, the main tram comes in and uh, loads it up in two ton cars and trams it out inside the portal to our ore sorter or our ore dump out there. Then after it's sorted, it's sorted into two piles, uh, one high-grade ore pile and one low-grade or waste pile. The ore is then uh, picked up in trucks and uh, crammed to our mill in Cannon City, where it's then further processed. The Carter Corporation's uranium mill near Canyon City, Colorado. Uranium ore processing takes six steps to complete. Grinding and crushing, leaching, filtration, precipitation, and packaging. The ore comes to the mill from the mine in 20-ton ore trucks. From there, it is primary crushed to minus two inches. It's fed to our ball mills and ground to minus 200 mesh, 75% minus 200 mesh.
from there it's sent to our leach circuit and there the uranium in the ore is put into solution with a strong leach liquor, a carbonate, bicarbonate solution. From that point, the solids have to be separated from the solution. So we're sent to our filtration circuit. The filtration is done on drum filters. The liquid from there goes to our precipitation circuits while the solids go to our tailings. The precipitation is done with a caustic soda. Precipitation is taking the uranium and turning it into yellow cake, a solid yellow cake. From there, it is sent to our dryer and packaged in 55-gallon drums and sent on to uh, further processing. There are many additional processes to be carried out before uranium becomes a fuel. Mixing, sizing and shaping, carbon coating, forming of the fuel rods, which incidentally look like this, and finally, loading of these rods into fuel elements. Since thorium is actually a little more plentiful than uranium, and U-238, that 99.3% of all uranium mined, has so far been considered a waste product, the use of these two elements could greatly extend the supply of fissionable fuels. Let's take a look at the breeder reactors. Breeder reactors are of particular interest today because they produce more fuel than they use. Uh, they hold, in fact, the potential for satisfying our basic energy needs for the next several hundred years. They accomplish this little bit of magic by a process that we call breeding. The process of breeding is nothing more than making efficient use of the neutrons that are left over from the normal fission process. There are, on the average, more than two neutrons available from the fission process, and if one of these neutrons is absorbed in an isotope, say, of uranium, U-238, it will eventually be transmuted into plutonium. That plutonium can be then recovered and utilized as fuel for uh, subsequent energy production. Water reactors essentially do the same thing, except they do not do it as efficiently as a breeder reactor. One of the misconceptions is that breeder reactors are very complicated systems. In fact, they're inherently not any more complicated to design and operate than a water reactor. Many people don't realize that the very first reactor in the world to produce electric power was a liquid metal cooled fast breeder reactor. That was done 26 years ago. It was chosen as the design to start out with because it was inherently rather simple and reliable. From that, a second generation reactor was developed, EBR2, and EBR2 has demonstrated rather well that electric power can be reliably generated with breeder reactors. In fact, the record of EBR2 compares very, very favorably with commercial plants. Foreign countries are now pursuing uh, breeder reactors for large-scale commercial application. The question of whether to deploy breeder reactors in this country is not a question of feasibility of design or safety, but rather a question of recovery of the plutonium from the uh, breeding elements. We have to face the question or answer the question of whether it is better to leave this plutonium in storage or to recover it for subsequent use in breeder reactors. There is another large issue to be encountered. With a proliferation of nuclear reactors producing highly irradiated spent fuels and daughter products, what do we do with it? Reprocess the fuel or store it for perhaps thousands of years? The administration has decided to defer this decision. But if long-term storage becomes the final choice, how do we do it safely? Well, the high-level waste exists as a liquid and contains nearly all of the radioactive waste that was in the spent fuel. We have developed processes for converting this liquid waste to a borosilicate glass material, a very durable product. One of the processes is a spray calciner in can melter process. In this process, the liquid waste is sprayed into a heated calciner chamber. The liquid droplets dry as they pass down through the calciner and fall into the in can melter. The in can melter serves as the process vessel as well as the final container for the glass product. The glass is melted at about 1,000 degrees centigrade 
requires the addition of a glass frit, which is simultaneously added to the canister as the calcine falls into it. When the canister is full, the calcine is then, and frit are then diverted to a second in-can melter. This canister is then removed from the furnace, a lid is welded on it, and it is ready to go to storage. A second process that has been developed is a continuous melter. This melter consists of bricks, which contain the molten glass and the calcine frit mixture, a steel housing around the uh, process and materials to contain all of the vapors. The calcine and frit from the previously described spray calciner falls in on the glass surface and insulates the glass. The glass is melted and kept molten by a set of electrodes which are on opposite sides of the melter. Electricity is passed through the melt to melt the calcine material between the electrodes. The glass then flows up through the wall of the melter, through an overflow trough, and down into the final storage canister. At Hanford, uranium metal fuel is used in the end reactor to produce plutonium for the weapons program and for the Department of Energy R&D program. In addition, with N-Reactor being a dual purpose uh, facility, steam is produced and electrical power generated. Upon completion of the irradiation cycle in the N-Reactor, the fuel is discharged into under, uh, for storage in underwater basins. When the irradiated fuel is ready for processing, it is transferred by shielded cast cars here on site to the Purex facility. In the Purex facility, the usable products, uranium, plutonium, and neptunium, are separated out chemically and transferred to other facilities for further processing and refinement. The waste products produced in Purex are transferred as liquid in underground pipes to the waste fractionization facility where they are further processed prior to underground storage in tankage. In the waste uh, fractionization facility, the waste stream is further processed by removing the strontium and cesium. These are high heat producers and we prefer to get them out of the mainstream of uh, store, uh, the long-term storage. The strontium and cesium are removed as liquid transferred over into the encapsulation facility where they are converted to solid form, strontium fluoride and cesium chloride. In this facility, they are encapsulated in double-walled stainless steel cylinders. These cylinders are then transferred to underwater storage basins for uh, long-term storage. The remaining liquid is transferred in underground piping to high-integrity double-walled tanks. These underground tanks are concrete tanks with double steel liners. They are fitted with uh, several types of instrumentation, uh, liquid level uh, measurement devices, uh, leak detection uh, monitoring in the annular region between the steel walls and outside to detect for any uh, potential leakage. After the liquid is aged for approximately five years to allow the short-lived isotopes to decay, the liquid is transferred through uh, to an evaporator facility for concentration. Approximately half of the liquid uh, is evaporated as drinking quality water or better than drinking quality water and is discharged uh, to uh, pond areas here on site for evaporation and percolation. The remaining uh, uh, fluid is a concentrated slurry which is stored in underground tanks as salt cake. Fusion, which is the power of the sun and other stars, is one form of energy being developed for electrical power production. The sun is a very hot gas, so hot in fact that the atoms in it have been ionized. Unlike fission, which is the splitting of a heavy atom, fusion is the joining or fusing of two light atoms. When fusion occurs, there is a concurrent release of energy. Fusion power reactors offer the promise of a virtually unlimited energy source because deuterium, the basic fuel for fusion reactors, is available in seawater and is plentiful enough to supply the world's energy needs for a billion years at present rates of consumption.
The General Atomic Corporation in San Diego, California, is the largest privately owned corporation engaged in fusion research, development, design, and construction. Building on the company's broad experience in advanced technology systems development and its 20 years of fusion research, General Atomic is constructing Doublet 3, one of the world's most advanced fusion devices. Here at General Atomic, we are doing basic fusion research and at the present time, building the world's largest magnetic confined experiment. This machine, as shown in this picture, is basically a toroidal configuration, a large donut, and is comprised of three coil systems and a vacuum chamber. Inside this vacuum chamber, we ionize a rarefied gas on the order of one one thousandth of an atmosphere, drive a current through that gas that heats it onto the order of 10 million degrees centigrade, about the temperature of the sun. Because this gas is very hot, it must be kept off of the walls of the vacuum chamber, and this is performed by our outer coil system here. In order to keep this hot ionized gas from the chamber wall, we have to create a magnetic field that will trap it. This field, created by the outer coil system, produces a magnetic field inside the vacuum chamber on the order of 40,000 gauss, or 40,000 times that of the Earth's magnetic field. Surrounding the vacuum chamber are the other two coil systems, here and here, that drive the current through the ionized gas to heat it, and also shape the field so that we can do perform the fusion experiments here at General Atomic. As you can see from the experiment behind me that the machine is of a rather large size. However, in order to produce electricity, we have to make machines three times larger. It is hoped that by the year 2000, we will have such machines producing commercial electricity. There are literally hundreds of aspects relative to nuclear energy which the concerned citizen may or may not be able to fully understand. We've touched briefly on only a few of the basics and gained some insight into a handful of the processes this form of energy requires. As an enlightened public views nuclear energy, it should be reminded that a judgment on this form of power must not only include an assessment of risks, but also a comparison assessment of environmental damage which could result from the use of available alternate fuels coal, for example, as well as a recognition of the facts about the demand for electric power and its growth, the long-range availability of fossil fuels, and the promise of new technology. At present, there is a mixed reaction from both the scientific community and the public. The promise of abundant electricity is not an unmixed blessing. To some extent, nuclear reactors represent a trade-off, the obvious disadvantages of coal as a fuel, for dangers still largely unquantified. It is safe to say, though, that the nuclear genie is out of his bottle. We will now see how well he is trained.